insight into what it all means. Joining us as always is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. Not much movie news on a day going into the Thanksgiving holiday and all of a sudden, boom. We'll talk about that in a bit. Boom. Also here, John Schnepp. Oh, do that dance. I do that dance. I do that dance. I have dance. no idea what's happening. I do, 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 do that dance, baby. What's going on this Wednesday? <laughs> Take it away, Christian Harlow. Do, 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 do that dance. Do, 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 do. By the way, your hair looks phenomenal. Oh, thank That's you. That's right. You're parting it differently or uh, something. I, really I dyed it. I'm parting it different. Oh, I'm great. so glad that you guys are liking it. You normally look like a train wreck, but today, yeah. today looks good. Today. Well, thank yeah. you, guys. Do, 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 do that dance. Do that right, hair. That's do that dance. That's Dancing with that do hair. That I'm sorry, are we done the introductions? Are we? Do we are done. Yes. All right, okay. Yes, we are. <laughs> All right, the wait is over. The Captain America Civil War trailer has finally dropped as Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. visited the Jimmy Kimmel show last night to reveal the new spot. Captain America Civil War picks up where Avengers Age of Ultron left off as Steve Rogers leads the new team of Avengers in their continued efforts to safeguard humanity. After another international <laughs> incident involving the Avengers, results in collateral damage, political pressure mounts to install a system of accountability and a governing body to determine when to enlist the services of the team. The new status quo fractures the Avengers while they try to protect the world from a new and nefarious villain. Captain America Civil War opens in theaters on May 6th. Schnepp, what do you think of the new trailer? Oh my god. So exciting. I was, I was finishing up Jessica Jones. Marvel, what are you trying to do to me? <laughs> I had to stop the 11th episode of Jessica Jones to watch this like eight times. This is incredible. It just came out of nowhere. None of us knew it was dropping, right? They had said that they were having them on to, to, uh, to promote something, so people were kind of speculating that yeah, it was going to Yeah, I got. I heard there was a lot of chatter on Twitter yesterday. Well, hey, look, like Chris Evans and Robert Downey Jr. going to be on Kimmel. You think they're going to drop the trailer? It became kind of obvious at okay. one point. Yeah. I guess I missed all that, and then it just was online, and people were like, the phone blowing up, and... Incredible. I mean, I want to ask you guys because you saw the D23 footage. To me, this trailer was epic. It was it was a thousand times better than anything I was even expecting. I didn't expect it to have that such an emotional core to it. It to me, it definitely like a, a the, the the successor to Winter Soldier has that Russo brothers feeling. Has that epic feeling. Uh, I. I love it. I can't stop watching. I just watched it like five minutes ago. He did. He was lit mm -hmm. right up until we started rolling. He was watching it on the phone yeah, some more. It's really, I was like, I cannot wait for this movie now. But you guys, well, I mean, what, if after you tell me what you thought of the trailer, like, I'd love to know what the differences are that from, because uh, you talked about Ant-Man. I didn't, he wasn't in it at yeah. all. Yeah, I, I loved the trailer. Loved it. it. It was great. It was so well crafted. A lot of times trailers, even some ones that, that seem like they're really good, but a lot of times trailers feel like they're just kind of slapped together. Like they just took a bunch of random footage from the movie, slapped together. This felt like an artistically crafted trailer. Every cut, every edit had a purpose and a flow to it. The musical notes in it were wonderful. They had great music selection that really fed into the emotion of it. All that kind of stuff. My one critique, my one critique, and this is the same critique I had after watching the footage of D23, is that it still feels a little small scale to me, like, you know, they're fighting in a back parking lot or, or something mm -hmm. like that. It still feels a little small scale, but I already had that sense coming out of D23. As a trailer, though, so great. Some of the highlights to me. Number one, we got three good shots of Black Panther. Oh, yeah. Who looked great. And in that microsecond of a cut, when you see... Uh, Captain America chasing down Black yeah. Panther in that underground totally. parking lot. And that one epic shot of just Black Panther standing there with the camera kind of panning a little bit. That looked amazing. The uh, the shot, which you miss it because a lot of the cuts in this trailer are very like are extremely fast. But that one shot of Tony laying, basically kneeling in a crater with uh, Rhodey, laying his lap, his... his uh, his armor is all ripped up and all that kind of stuff. I don't think he's dead. I don't think they would give that away. I mean, I've been predicting that he's going to die in this movie, but I don't think that's a death shot. That would be giving away way too much yeah. in a trailer. But Tony clearly looked devastated. But <clears throat> by far, the money shot is that last one with Cap and Bucky beating up on Iron Man. Um, Tossing the that was back some, and forth. That was some great WWE stuff right there. <laughs> you had the guy down and they're just taking turns back and forth. Oh, and that one shot too, where it's, I guess, just Bucky fighting Iron Man. 
and he pounds him against the wall, and he looks like he's taking his metallic cannon going in for his power quarter. So much good stuff. But more important than all these big money shots was we finally get a sense of the story. Yeah. And it seems like a, the MacGuffin in this movie in this movie seems like it's going to be Bucky himself. Mm. I mean, in many ways that he looks like he becomes kind of the flashpoint of what's dividing them. I think the government wants to bring him in. Cap ain't standing for it. On top of that, you've got, you know, the general coming in, uh, laying out this new law they want to lay out that you've got to be under the, the direction of the guy. I mean, so much good. Perfect amount of story they revealed. Great money shots. And still a very distinct lack of any Spider-Man at this point. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Christian, you saw it. Your reaction to it. Loved this trailer. I mean, I couldn't love this trailer anymore because of the main thing, what you said there was the story. And the question was from a lot of fans, though, too, is how are they going to tell this Civil War story? And by using Bucky as a device, I think it's perfect yeah. because that can divide audiences as well to like, well, Iron Man's right. Oh, Cap's right. you got to do that with the fans as well as the the, the government and whoever else they're, they're going up against in, in the movie. And there's so many great shots. And the one that I liked, even though they're beating the crap out of Iron Man, it's that line getting up to it as far as he's my friend so was I so was I that was a, such a great line, line great and line. it was subtle and you're just like oh man because now that it, it's not it's not like oh he's a bad guy now he's a heel it's like they all have a cause and for what they're doing and those shots of Black Panther but Schnapp, to, to answer your question as far as the D23 and what's the difference kind of what John said in the beginning of, of when he was his opinion was that in D23, even though it was incredible, it was a lot of footage that they just kind of put together to show you this is this epic this field. This is what's coming. Gonna, yeah. That, that and it was more have. lighthearted, too. It was, because the Ant-Man scene that you were mentioning, was, it was it's, so just, it's really funny. <laughs> and then John and I were talking about it, too. It, just, it wouldn't have fit in this trailer because mm -hmm. they're showing you the more serious aspect of what sure. leads them to this. Um, and even with the humor that they put inside that D23 stuff, it did work. And... It's just why I think, for me, the Russos have a better hold on this right now than I think Joss Whedon did for Ultron. Because like what you were saying with um, it seems like a smaller scale, I like that. I like the fact that they were fighting in this parking lot because I think when they when they try to overdo it and there's so many things happening, it just becomes one big action scene that you get lost in as opposed to when I see these two guys going, they're fighting for passion. They're right. fighting for something that they're really invested in. And it doesn't have to be in like a big grand scale thing because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be grand because you have all these characters fighting against one another so this is the movie that i wanted to see it seems that the trailer is giving us that movie so i mean i'm all on board yeah and they definitely set it up emotionally with like by having uh the william hurt general care general thunderbolt ross yeah. kind of coming yeah. in laying down the law you're a vigilante and then that one line where they it could have went like weedy or funny like tit for tat but they didn't do it at least in the trailer so i hope they keep it that way is like when Tony Stark is, I want to punch you in your perfect mouth. Right, right. But then they show Cap just looking like, you know what I mean? It's like it's not a funny moment. It's more like this is the beginning of the the fight between these two guys who were allies. So it's great. It's perfect to me. Perfect now, I, trailer. They, the, the trailer alludes to or makes a suggestion that whatever happens to Rhodey as he's laying there broken and the armor destroyed and all that kind of stuff with Tony, the, the suggestion is that that's a result of a fight with Cap or Bucky or anybody else on Cap's side. I have a feeling it might be a third, the, the third yeah. party villain that mm. did that. I got a feeling that that little part might have been a little bit misleading, but I don't give a crap because right. it made for a great, great trailer. This was the first time out of the little stuff we've seen before, plus the D23 footage, plus a number of these other things, that I really got the sense of the depth of emotion to it. Because everything else up until this point, I haven't really felt it. Especially one of the criticisms we had coming out of D23, it's like, it doesn't really feel like they're fighting. Right. It feels like they're supposed to be fighting. But, you know, we saw that one scene of, of Black Widow and Hawkeye, uh, like, struggling on the ground. They're on two different sides in this. But as they're fighting and throwing punches, like, we're still having dinner Saturday, right? Or, or we're still friends, you right? Yeah, dinner Saturday. And, like, doing it, it's like, huh. So I'm not... Right. But this trailer wipes that out right. and and i get camera i think it was you that brought it in or, or one of the two of you brought that one line when when cap says I, i'm really sorry but he's my friend and tony says so was i mm -hmm. yeah oh and, and even if he had said so am i the their use their choice of words so was i mm. was heartbreaking yeah and, and it added to the tension and the excitement of the shot as well okay so we mentioned noticeable by his absence was Spider-Man. We're still not seeing anything in Spider-Man. But 
We did see Hawkeye in the D23 footage. I didn't get a glimpse of him in, in this the footage running here. Shot. Hawkeye is well, did, was he? Yeah. I He's didn't, in that running I didn't shot. notice but him in the running with shot. With Scarlet okay. Witch, too. Yeah. All of them are in that right. running but shot. With Spider-Man, though, I want them to treat Spider-Man the way they're treating Luke. I don't want to see Spider-Man in any of the trailers. I don't need to. I've seen enough of Spider-Man yeah. in, in movies. I know who Spider-Man is. Um, I It would be so much more of an impact when I see Spider-Man in the movie. I don't think you need to see him in any of the trailers. That would, be, that would be a colossal mistake. Oh, I don't know. Because Spider-Man in the Marvel Universe, he is their most popular guy. He's you don't need most... him to sell this movie, though. I I, I would... think, yeah, you do. He's going to be. Do. like What they're doing is they're setting up the the division. They're setting up in this first trailer, they're saying Captain America and Iron Here's Man the are problem. fighting. And yeah. the posters all show that really well, too. Great, po great poster great selection. Poster, I love all three way, of them. Yeah. Fabulous posters. Um, you don't think that gets people in the theater without Spider-Man? You know uh, what? But, but it, it doesn't does. get them all. It, it yeah. gets people like really excited about this movie. It has the tone of this trailer is perfect. The next trailer that they'll probably drop like in three months, that's going to be the one where you'll see Spider-Man ha having to make a decision. Like They're going to introduce that, that third element of what Civil War is all about. Like, you have two different teams now, and obviously Cap is, like, trying to fight for Bucky to not get just get thrown in jail or whatever this situation is going to be mm -hmm. with that. But there's also going to introduce that Spider-Man aspect of what side is he going to yeah. be on. I guess I a lot of people don't realize that he's in the movie like we do at as this well, point. Too, so. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of people in the general public who don't <laughs> obsessively, like, nut right. jobs, follow all this stuff as closely as we do. Uh, are probably not keen in. I still don't think Spider-Man is a huge important deal in this movie. I still think he his role is a rather minor one, but still, you're bringing Spider-Man in. I think there's going to be a lot of film fans out there who maybe have heard maybe Spider-Man will be here, whatever, don't watch movie talk, don't follow the online movie sites like you're saying, that you put out the trailer that's three months out or that's two months out from Civil War, and you show a shot of Spider-Man swinging. That's going to excite a lot of people. Or heck, even Spider-Man, just like Tony Stark and Iron Man, they're fighting. I mean, uh, Captain America and Iron Man are fighting. You have Spider-Man. Like, I thought you guys were friends. Or yeah. just a quick thing with yeah. him, and then show him for one other action scene. People would be like, he's in the movie. Definitely. You know? yeah. It's just you know what's funny though too, because I watched this trailer last night, and I didn't think about Spider-Man <laughs> once. Yeah, neither did I. Oh, I didn't until afterwards. Yeah. It was afterwards upon reflecting on saying, hey, we didn't see this. They didn't show Iron Man. Or Ant-Man I mean, or maybe, Vision. Sorry, yeah. I, mean, I mean, did I say Iron Man? I meant Ant-Man, although maybe he was very much in the scene. He was just, you know, this, yeah. this right. small there, right. and, right. and we don't right. see him, so that's, that's cool right. too. But I think they're going to follow a pattern here. This was the dark, heavy trailer. I think we will see in another month or so another trailer that's going to highlight the levity of it. That, look, hey, guys, this is still a Marvel film. At some point, they're going to show us that Ant-Man spot that we saw right. at D23, which killed. Mm. Absolutely killed. But like you said, we were talking about it afterwards because some people, I got some tweets saying, hey, why don't you think they put that Ant-Man spot that Ant-Man bit that was really funny and really hilarious that they showed at Doom 23 in the trailer. And it's like you pointed out, it's because this trailer was not the place for that footage. This was a heavy, serious trailer. And then to go, and by the way, folks, da -da 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 -da, <laughs> it wouldn't work. But you got another trailer coming that I think they'll use that, that I think they introduce us to Spider-Man giving a quippy mm. one-liner or something like that. You show a balance, you broaden the appeal. All I know is, look, they may mess up their marketing strategy from here on out. But there is no denying, holy crap, they crushed yeah. it out of the gate. It made me stop thinking about Star Wars for about three hours. For, yeah, yeah, for, right. yeah. Like, oh too. my God, Absolutely. there's another incredible yeah. movie coming in six months. And then it made me think about, oh, and then there's Batman v Superman two months before that. So it's just... Speaking you know. of which, I, look, I love this trailer so much. I will, I will say I've liked this trailer. And this is me just trying to be objective, it's difficult. I think this trailer is better than any of the Star Wars trailers. Uh, Star Wars is going to be the better movie. But um, I think this is my second best trailer of the year behind Batman v Superman. I think this is my second favorite trailer. I mean, this trailer was just... I, I sat there and watched it. Only two trailers. Well, no, three. The Star Wars trailer, the Batman v Superman trailer, and now this trailer are the trailers that I just sat and hit... Re, like reload, 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 and just watch it again and again and again. I would argue, I mean, for myself, uh, the trailer, at least for me, that actually hit me right in the emotional gut was the Star Wars trailer. No other yeah. trailer had that kind of emotional, nostalgic resonance. But I'm trying to take my emotion out no, of it. No, I know, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying saying not to be that biased. made me tear up as yeah, far as just like seeing true. all these characters yep. that I grew up with as a kid 
in this movie that was promised to me as a kid. Now I'm seeing it. That was too emotionally powerful, and that it looks great. It was. It looks like a really good film. So to me, at least, that trailer is the one that emotionally hit me. This one is a close second because it really follows characters that I grew up with as a kid. Now seeing them as an adult in like movies, like big budget action films, is crazy enough as it is. But that they're done at such a high quality level is just fantastic. Yeah, I think for me, the second teaser for Star Wars, the one that they showed a celebration, was the one like you were oh, saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just that it introduced like it was the first time you saw Han Solo again back as Han Solo when you said that. That's Han Solo. Still it, the greatest moment of any it trailer. Is, this and it, year. Was, and it yeah. also introduced you to the tone that I believe we're going to get and totally. reintroducing you to the original yeah. trilogy. I actually put that in my, th in this one in my third. Uh, because I actually really enjoyed, even though I've seen the movie now and I love it, is Creed. Mm -hmm. When I saw the Creed trailer for the first time, um, it, it, it had these... Like you're talking about nostalgia. I had these images of what Creed would be, and then they showed it, and then that scene with Rocky when he's talking to him, at, and you see the picture, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, I got the feels for it, because I'm a massive, but, but my emotion's in there because I'm a massive Rocky fan. <laughs> mm. But I thought, to me, those are the th my three favorite trailers. So yes, you guys. Oh, I was okay. going to say, speaking of Creed, I, I'm hearing that Ryan Coogler's in the running for Black Panther now. Yeah, I hope that, so. That, that, that so, is, that is so. the discussion. Yeah, dude, he's that's one of my discussion. favorites right now. Right. That dude is awesome. He puts his heart and soul in everything he I does. Mean, if you, if he, he should have been in the running already just because of Fruitvale, Fruitvale Station. Station. Yeah. I mean, that should have put him in the running right there. So let me ask you guys this. Was there anything in this trailer that surprised you? Was there anything that we were watching in the trailer? Because I'll, I'll say for me, the premise surprised me. The premise that, oh, and it sh we should have known. I don't know why I didn't think about it, but the fact that Bucky seems to be a sparking point mm -hmm. for this whole thing. That was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, for me, the other surprise was that scene of Rhodey lying in, in the crater. Um, was there anything else that jumped out to you that you were either surprised they didn't put in or surprised that they did put so in? I was surprised that I didn't see that Ant-Man thing, but it makes sense with the tone of the, the way they had the trailer. But the most surprising th thing to me was the theme of friendship and emotionality yeah. to the entire trailer where they established that, oh my God, that's Bucky and that's Cap and they were friends. He was like, yeah, you're the guy who used to stuff your shoes. They're friends, and he's not going to give up on his friend. You know, yeah. Cap and you know, and, and Iron Man, Tony Stark and, and Steve Rogers, they're friends, but they're on two different sides, and it becomes, obviously, it comes to a fight, you know? So, oh. I mean, I think that, the way they played it off, and just with those minimal lines, obviously, it's all superhero stuff, but they, they were able to cut to the, the emotional core to it. I didn't expect that. Yeah, I think the surprise for me was watching Bucky and Cap kick the crap out of Iron Man in that scene. That because, was so great. Because, because it, like you said, it just it just erased the, uh, they're just going to be kind of like, well, we should we fight? Yeah, stop, stop, stop. It's like they actually really, they're fighting, they're fighting and it, it looks like, Civil War, so I was and, and the roadie scene, but the, the the fact that they were really going at it and really fighting and that they, they believe in this cause. Well, speaking <coughs> of surprises, let's move on to item number two. As most of you know, Universal Pictures has been gearing up to launch a shared cinematic universe with their classic Monsters roster. Today, that universe got a huge step forward as Variety is reporting that Tom Cruise has signed on to star in the first movie, The Mummy. The Mummy will be directed by Alex Kurtzman based on a script from John Spates, the writer of Prometheus. The Mummy reboot is set for release on March 24, 2017 with another untitled Universal Monsters movie set to follow it on March 30, 2018. 18. John, is the addition of Tom Cruise a good move for the new Universal Monsters Cinematic Universe? I'm stunned. Absolutely mm -hmm. stunned. This is the movie equivalent of when I woke up one morning to hear that the Edmonton Oilers had traded Wayne Gretzky to the Los Angeles Kings. Like, <laughs> like what? What? Look, we've been looking at this... Universal Monsters franchise. Now, granted, we haven't known a lot. Kurtzman was involved and all that kind of stuff, and I like Kurtzman, but to me, it has felt, and we might have just talked about this the other day, this whole Universal Monsters thing seems a little bit of folly. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to do much. They didn't help the cause much with that terrible Dracula movie they just had out like right. last year. Or the Wolfman. Or the Wolfman that came out long before that. Uh, it, and so we've been looking at this saying, okay, this would be a nice little thing they're doing. It's not going to make any waves. It's not going to be a real thing. I mean, let them do it. Tom Cruise, who is at the height of, of his career right now, signs up for it. And this is one of those absolute instant perception changes. Mm -hmm. Now we're all looking at this Universal Monsters cin cinematic universe thing totally differently than we did yesterday. Now suddenly we're looking at it and we're like, Oh, Universal is dead serious about this. 
And clearly they've got something there if Tom Cruise, who right now can do not only anything he wants, he can make anything he wants. He doesn't have to just go join whatever movie he wants to join. He can come up with his producer buddies and all that kind of stuff and Christopher McQuarrie and just say, hey, we want to do this movie about shoes. And they would do a movie about <laughs> shoes and they can do it and people would back it. And he's choosing to do The Mummy. I don't know if this movie's going to be good or bad or whatever. All I know is that my perception of this thing has now completely done a 180. Christian, you heard this news. Your reaction to Tom Cruise joining the Universal's thing? It reminded me of when Shaquille O'Neal went to the Heat. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it did. It was because I because you look at that and you say, wait, like what you just said. I liked the first Mummy movie, and then after the rest, I was like, eh. and then they're announcing the reboot, and that they were doing, you know, this shared universe, and and they they did they tried to do it with the Dracula movie, and they, they then they're kind of discarding that because it was such a stinker, and you're like, well, who cares? And then you get Tom Cruise, and you're like, well, wait a minute, because Tom Cruise, and we've said this when we were talking about the Mission Impossible movies. He commits to everything he does. Whatever yeah. movie he's going to do, he's going to put every bit of effort into it because he knows what the fans want, or at least gives them what he thinks that they want. Um, and this, to me, uh, yeah, I'm excited about it now. I, I'm curious to what a version of the Mummy with Tom Cruise looks like. I'm a version now that uh, I'm, I'm excited now that there's a version of, with Tom Cruise that this shared universe happens. Like, okay, wait a minute, I just really liked what they did there with the Mummy. Um, now, well, how's that going to spin into something else? Because Tom Cruise. Is, he's a star because it makes sense if you're trying to do this uh, you're trying to reboot this mummy franchise and catapult a shared universe out of it smart executives and smart creative people are going to win. okay well we need star power but we need star power with somebody that knows how to produce stuff who knows how to make stuff who can create an impact and somebody goes how about tom cruise we're not gonna get tom cruise and then you get tom cruise now your franchise is is look is shaping up to be something special yeah well, I can't do a sports analogy. Captain Crunch, but it's all Crunch Berries. What about, it's an all Crunch Berries episode. Tom Cruise of the Crunch Berries. Uh, I was stunned, but you know what? It, it instantly made me rethink The Mummy. Because they cast Tom Cruise, I wasn't excited about it. Yeah, Universal's going to try to drag out all the, the movies that I love, the original ones, and they keep trying to redo them. But then the minute they added Tom Cruise, my entire brain sphere just flipped, and I was like, what if it's all set now? It's not like some 1930s mummy. I think it's that all is. set I think now. It's supposed to be modern what day. if it's yeah, like cool. uh, it's not like the Brennan Fraser mummies with the little baby mummies and stuff like that? But if they do, uh, if they <laughs> add this other, mummies. remember they had the dumb baby <laughs> yeah. mummies? Yeah. They're all chasing and mummies. Stuff. Yeah, but whatever they're called, I hated it. Um, but they could add this other element to it, where like bandages are alive or what? I mean, they could they could add something uh, that we haven't seen yet. And that's the kind of I started thinking about, like, wow, if they updated the mummy and they updated if they're updating all of their universal creatures and monsters to be in the world now. Let's forget about Dracula untold, like yeah. un best left untold. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, boy. And then they like threw that dude in the future. Like, yeah, I'm still walking around with this weird pendant anyway. Hopefully they just forget about all that stuff. Start fresh. If you have Tom Cruise, I think that's a great starting off point. So I'm looking forward to it. All of a sudden, I'm looking forward to it. You know, there was a one point Tom Cruise was supposed to be involved in the, the Universal Monsters universe. At one point, he had considered playing Van Helsing. Mm. I believe the I believe it was the one that uh, Hugh Jackman. Good pass. Good pass. <laughs> yeah. That's one of those wow. ones you sit back and go, whew. Yeah, what right? happened to Stephen Sommers, by the way? He's even nowhere oh. to be seen. Stephen Sommers... Uh, director Steven yeah, Summers, by the way, who did The Mummy and stuff like that. I he fell out of favor with as a as me with me as a fan and a few other people. He did GI Joe. Yeah, and I remember very distinctly after GI Joe came out and the critics hated it, yeah. and so and I hated it. Um, I, well, well, actually, you know, let me let me step back from that. It was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. The first GI Joe movie right. was not as bad as I thought it was going to be, but it was still not a good movie. Anyway. Summers comes out, I remember, and went on this big diatribe about, you know, well, critics just don't like popular movies. I'm like, really? Lord of the Rings, 96%. Uh, Avengers this, or the, uh, Batman we got this rating. Really? It seems to me critics really do like yeah. fan favorite movies. But it, he just whined and complained, and, and then he kind of dropped off. He was then lined up to do another big project that I think fell through, and we just haven't heard from was him Flash since. Flash Gordon, I think, at one point? 
That was. sounds right. I'm yeah, not I'm, sure. But that you know sounds why I right. think it was because I'm not a Stephen Saunders fan at all, and I'm a big Flash Gordon fan. And I remember being upset that I heard that, and I think it went away. Mm. Um, and then, and then Matthew Vaughn's rumored somebody do Flash Gordon soon, please. Right? <laughs> hey, maybe they can bring Stephen Summers back to direct this new Mummy, right, Ooh. guys? Oh. oh no, Alex Kurtzman. Alex oh, Kurtzman is right. directing uh, this new Mummy. All right, folks. Well, listen, it is Wednesday, which means it's time for us to do a little bit of rewind brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. This is the segment where we, I affectionately refer to as the feeling old segment. We're going to talk about the film celebrating their 10th birthdays this week and their 20th birthdays this week. So let's start with the film celebrating their 10th anniversary. Opening 10 years ago this week was Ice Harvest. Um, in the mix, Just Friends, the big screen version of Rent, and Yours, Mine, and Ours, and celebrating, what an anniversary this is, celebrating their 20th anniversary, Toy Story, opened 20 years ago this week. Also opening another classic, Casino, opened 20 years ago this week, um, Money Train, and Nick of Time. Schnepp, you heard all these movies celebrating anniversaries. Which ones stand out to you? Well, now, so you were mentioning uh, Just Friends, and I was like, I don't think I saw that. And then I saw the poster with the fat Ryan Reynolds, and I, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, I remember seeing that. And I didn't hate that movie. Remember, I was like, I didn't, it just yeah. didn't, it doesn't register with me. I was like, oh, yeah, and then he lost weight, and he goes back to his hometown. It's a fun film. What really registers with me, though, is the 20-year-old ones, Toy Story, yeah. and, of course, Casino. Both of those movies are incredible on completely different fronts for completely different reasons. Can you believe reasons. they opened on the same weekend? That's insane. That's, nuts, That's yeah. amazing. I don't think I saw them back to back. That wasn't like a double feature. Like, <laughs> let's see Toy Story and then Casino. I'd be like, let's flip it a little bit, have that little flavor, not the depressing. Martin Scorsese just killed it. I mean, this follow-up to Goodfellas, nothing could ever be Goodfellas. And I think him and the writer of Goodfellas knew that, so they went in this other direction and still were able to tell a fantastic, enthralling, Big story with all the all the people that we love from Goodfellas playing different roles in in, uh, in Casino. So to me, I love Casino. I, I revisit that film every uh, three or four years. I see it again. And uh, Toy Story. What else can be said about it? It's an amazing, incredible 3D film. It really sold everyone on the ability to be able to do 3D feature filmmaking. Yeah, that was it. Was, it was it. just that was it. They'd done their shorts. This was the one, and this is the one that just changed the entire industry. And we're used to we're just so used to 3D movies nowadays. This was the first one that actually worked. So and it's a it's a great story. I'm happy to see that there's Toy Story 4 coming out. Sure, 20 years later, this is a series that just can keep going forever. Yeah. And I'll just let you guys know next week we have a special video coming out, us ranking the top ten Pixar films of mm -hmm. all time. That's right. Right. Uh, you might see Toy Story pop up on Maybe. that list. It might Maybe. be there. Anyway, which which of these films celebrating anniversary stand out to you? It's funny because a lot of the twenty year ones. Because as we've been doing the twenty year ones, I'm going, why have I seen all of these movies? <laughs> and the reason why I worked in a movie theater when all these came oh, out. Oh, that's hilarious! So I saw all of these, totally. and Nick of Time stinks. Yeah. I remember being excited Horrible. about that movie yep. when because it, the trailer was so cool, and it's it's terrible, but. Casino is one of my favorites uh, for sure. I mean, it, you can it's it's rewatchable, like you said. It's not Goodfellas, obviously, but it's still, it certainly has that Scorsese feel and in it. Sharon Stone, really. Yeah, cool. man, yep. she's, she's really good. But to watch Pesci and De Niro for the third time together was was pretty special. Money Train is a guilty movie pleasure. I really enjoy that <laughs> stupid movie. And um, and Toy Story. Again, I remember seeing it with all my friends going, okay, because the trailers kept playing in the theater. And I'm like, well, what is this? You know, this is a different kind of, this looks kind of cool. And just being blown away when we saw it. As far as a 10 year, I know that I'm in the minority also, too. And, I, and I, as I hear myself talk about Zoolander, I'm just, it's, I just, I guess I'm a really tough critic on comedies because I did not, did not like Just Friends at all. And I'm a big Ryan mm -hmm. Reynolds fan. It's just, I thought he was obnoxious as uh, when he got older. And that was the point, excuse me, when he got thin, that was the mm -hmm. point. But he was obnoxious when he was uh, bigger as well, too. And I was like, so the movie itself to me was ah, but um, I don't. What were the Ice Harvest. Years? I forgot to mention Ice Harvest. I remember yeah, right. seeing that. It's Angelina like, Jolie's in that one too, yeah, right? Very, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even Billy Bob Thornton and John Cusack. Very strange film. It's a cable remember, movie. Yeah, it's That's a, a definition film. of a cable movie. Yeah. Um, to me, uh, the one. Well, you guys already covered Toy Story, obviously. Casino, obviously. I wasn't a big friend, a fan of either Nick of Time or uh, Money Train. 
I unabashedly love Just Friends. I think that is an (laughs) underappreciated comedy. I think that's a little gold nugget that if you and your friends are saying you don't know what to watch one night and you stumble across it and it's like, I really don't know much about it. it. Pop it in. I think you're going to enjoy it. Amy Smart is so damn cute. Mm -hmm. Anna Faris is hilarious, uh, also known as Mrs. Uh, uh, Chris Pratt. Um, Remember there was a day, I remember there was a day when, when you heard that Anna Faris and Chris Pratt are together. It's like, She's so much more popular than him. Right. <laughs> now, yeah, it's a different conversation now. But she's got a hit TV show now. And she is so funny. She is so funny in uh, Just Friends. So make sure you check that out. But yeah, what a great weekend. Yeah. What a great weekend in history. All right, folks. We are now going to go to Mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question that you would like brought up on the show, just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. And then we're going to save a little bit extra time for our live Twitter questions. This is the final movie talk of the week. We're going to take Thursday and Friday off to celebrate the holidays here. But if you want to get in a live Twitter question, for those of you who are watching us live, and there's a boatload of you watching us live right now, just follow us on Twitter at Collider Video, and then tweet on in a question, and Ashley will pick some out at the end. But for now, let's get to some mailbag questions. So Ashley, what do we got? Robert Clark writes, hey guys, would you be interested in seeing another non-Star Wars movie directed by George Lucas? No. No, I would not. Uh, George, it, it, look, George has never liked working with actors, and my big thing is that the director's first job is to get the best performance out of your actors as you can. I would, I am, to- I would be totally down for another ten years watching movies that George Lucas conceptualizes and produces with a talented filmmaker as a director at his side. I'd be very interested to see what he does there. Honestly, not interested. I worship at the altar of George Lucas, but honestly, not interested in seeing stuff he would direct at this point. What about you? Yes if it was something in which he might not be able to do again, but yes, if it was something like American Graffiti, if it was a movie. Small indie story. Yeah, if it was a smaller movie, he can do that now. I mean, this is kind of going off of what what, uh, Joss Whedon did with. uh, Much Ado About Nothing. Yes. Small, you know, if you, just to tell a story, he doesn't need to further technology anymore. He doesn't need to just show cool things and sell toys. Tell a story because he's a great storyteller. He really is, and and he's 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 obviously been bit by the way. He, I guess the fans have accepted the new Star Wars and everything too, and he's he, he's a little bitter bitter about it. I want to see him go and take that emotion and everything too, and put it into a small story. That would that would excite me. I think. Uh... I love all of George Lucas's early work. I love THX 1138. I love American Graffiti. I think uh, he was a really great filmmaker. I love Star Wars. He made that film. Um, over the years, especially after after the prequels came out and just the backlash, I think he kept talking about, I'm going to retire and just make my own uh, you know, films, experimental films, art in my house garage, films. Yeah. art house yeah. films. And yo, man, George Lucas, I've been waiting. Yeah, you said that like 15 years ago. You've got at least one fan here. We'll see every single film that you make if you stick to what you were talking about. Make some experimental art house films, dude. You got hundreds of millions of dollars. He's been very busy counting his money. I know. He's very Get off busy. the pile of money. Get on to make those experimental films. <laughs> we'll champion them if they're great. And I think you've got it in you. So we're all looking forward to you seeing you and what you want to do with something that's non Star Wars. I'm all for it. All right. What's next? Benjamin Weaver writes, Hi guys, I love your stuff. You keep talking about who might die in Star Wars The Force Awakens. John Campia keeps thinking that it will be Finn. I don't think so because it would upset a lot of people wanting to see a major black character in Star Wars. My question is, what if no significant characters die in the movie, not including minor characters? What if every major player is alive at least at the end of Episode 7? Uh, well, first of all, John Camby does not keep saying it's going to be Finn. One time I said, one time I said, because he's the, because he's so enthusiastic about it. One time I said, kind of sounds like a guy who knows he's, this is his only time in Star Wars. Wait, you just said it again. <laughs> <laughs> you keep saying yeah. it. Um, this this whole notion of oh they won't do because they won't want to kill off the black character. It's that's nonsense. Throw that out of your head right away. First of all, the story was written. Uh, John Boyega himself told us that there was the, the character in the script was not a black character. It just wasn't. They just went out and got who they thought would be the best. Imagine that. They went out and got who they just thought would be the best actor to play the role. Figo figure. But in the script, he was not. they didn't describe him as a black guy or a white guy or whatever. So they already knew before they cast a black actor to be in it if this character Finn makes it out of episode seven or not. So this whole discussion going on online is all rather pointless and has no merit to it. 
So that aside, and who cares? You do what's best. I don't care if they kill Poe. I don't care if they kill whatever. Do what's best for the story, whatever mm -hmm. that is. You do that. Don't let politics d dictate who lives, who dies, whatever. Give them a great character with a great life and a great death if that's what it takes. Um, it is very possible that everybody makes that. And, and, and to be honest and to be fair, you're right. That is really not, even though I think in the back of the heads we all know that, yeah, I think maybe nobody dies. That's not really been one of the options we've really talked about. It's always the context of, well, which one is going to die? Um, and I still believe somebody is. Um, I, I, and I think there's a possibility it's Finn. It ain't going to be Ray uh, that dies. Might be Leia, might be Han, might be Chewie. I don't think it's Han. But um, that is definitely a possibility that all of them make it out of this first one. And then we have, so you have a Star Wars kind of ending. And then you get into your Empire Strikes Back second film where some really bad things go down. So that's totally a possibility. How do you see it? I think if you have a leader's board, if Finn's not on it, I think it would probably start with Han Solo. I actually think Kylo Ren has a good shot of going out. And I think that, um, you know, it, it, like Chewie. But those, those are your leaders as far as who's going out. But it is very possible that no one dies and they just move on and let you develop a little bit more into them. So when someone finally does, someone's going to die in the trilogy. That will happen. Oh, yes. Um, and how, when that happens, it's a question, is it more it, it, whoever, J.J. or Ryan Johnson, whoever's telling the story, is does it serve the story to kill off one of the characters in Episode 7 or Episode 8 or Episode 9? Um, like I said, I still I, I think it's very possible that you could get, I, I think because Andy Serkis is such a, and I've been thinking about this a lot, and we'll talk about this on Jedi Council, but I think because Andy Serkis is such a, big actor and we when you see him as far as what he's done as caesar and Gollum and and just in general snoke's gonna be a big player in this i have trilogy. a feeling yeah i believe that too that's why i wouldn't be surprised with the, the kind of bait and switch of setting up kylo ren to be this big character and then he's you almost you take him out at the end of this movie i wouldn't be surprised I think R two D two is going to die. <laughs> oh man, so, Mark Ellis just cried. They already brought in his replacement. Yeah, they got a, the little roly ball thing. So uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, if you look at Star Wars: Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi, somebody dies in all of them. There's a main character who dies yeah. in every single one of them. So <clears throat> what's going to happen in this one? Someone's going to die. I don't know who's going to die. We'll see. <laughs> all right, what's next? Ryan Boucher writes, hey guys, love the show. Do you think that The Force Awakens will at least have references to the prequel trilogy? I know they were not as loved as the original trilogy, but it would be nice to at least see a planet like Naboo or Kashyyyk return. What are your thoughts? Thanks. Um, yeah, and, and by the way, speaking of the prequels, we now have two of our commentary videos up. We have our Phantom Menace and now our Attack of the Clones commentaries up. For those of you who are asking, you can find it on our YouTube channel uh, as well. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think they're going to do as much as they can to avoid talking about things and reminding people about the prequels but they are everything all the stuff you mentioned is part of the universe and there's no getting around it i think you've got to reference it you've got to reference i think naboo will come up because ultimately <clears throat> that's where i mean luke and leia's grandmother is from mm -hmm. at, at one point you've got to i think kajik will come into it i think there are a lot of things that were well then again kajik was was canon before the prequels ever happened, but that we would never seen it. I do believe there'll be some references that will share allusions to things that happen in the prequels, but I don't think you're going to hear conversations about midichlorians. You're not going to hear about uh, a number of things, but references, yeah, I think there are going to be references there. Schnapp. Well, I would love to see Jar Jar's homeworld get blown up by the Star Killer. <laughs> That's like I, the most. I just hope that happens. Hornaboo. Uh, and then, there you go. There you get your reference. All of the Jar Jar <laughs> friends and everybody gets exploded. The so, boom guns. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think they'll be references because there are a lot of cool things that are part of the, the prequel era for sure and I think that you can I'd actually be very and I, even when there's those, these rumors of Hayden Christensen appearing in episode 8 um, I, st I didn't hate that idea because I want to see what, what in a, if it's a flashback whatever to what Ryan Johnson's vision of the Clone Wars looks like right. I want to see what certain filmmakers will either either do or the way that they'll incorporate that into stories I think it'd be really cool and I think that even in anthology films I still I'm holding out hope that Darth Maul appears in an Obi Wan anthology film, and you can and you'd have to make reference to some of the Clone Wars stuff that happened with them if that happens. So it's such a vast universe, and the fact that we're getting a movie once a year, and there's such a big history, it, it's inevitable. 
All right, last mailbag question before we go to the live Twitter questions. Colby Porter writes, Hi guys, I know people aren't <laughs> fans of A Million Ways to Die in the West, but I'm in the minority who liked it, and I thought Seth MacFarlane was not as bad as people said he was. I think he has real potential to become an actor. So I ask you guys, would you like Seth MacFarlane as a live action actor if he had a better director and script? Oh no, he was as bad as everybody said he was. He was, he was absolutely <laughs> as bad. I am a big uh, Seth MacFarlane fan, actually. I will watch anything this dude writes. I will watch anything this dude directs. I will watch him host Saturday Night I thought he was a great host on Saturday Night Live, and I really liked him as a host of the Oscars. I thought he was funny and edgy and brought stuff that they were just not ready for, apparently. But I thought he did some really funny stuff at the Oscars. But an actor, he is not. Uh, he's a song and dance man, all that kind of stuff. But one of the big problems, you know, Dennis says this a lot, and I agree with him. One of the big problems with that was the fact of who, as the director, who Seth MacFarlane chose as the lead actor of the film, which was himself. And that was a mistake. Um, just did not work uh, on that level. And he is a genius. I think this guy's got an, a mind for entertainment. He just does. Big fan of his. But I'm not going to be running out for the next movie starring Seth MacFarlane. Anyway, what do you think? I don't want him anywhere near a live action film. He's a terrible actor. I mean, really bad. My dad, who called me up one day and loved Ted, called me up. And it, it was this strain in my dad's voice because he had just watched it. And it was almost like someone like farted in the car and locked the windows. He's, he's, he's like, he goes, oh. Oh man, that that, that Seth MacFarlane, I'm just just awful, just awful, and, and and like it was so he was he just couldn't he's just not an actor. It's some guys that just don't have it. Plus, even if he could act, he's got no leading, he's got no charisma as far as an actor goes. But super funny guy, super talented. Love him as a voiceover actor, and want to see him do more projects like that. And I want to see him write more stuff as well too. But I mean, even with Ted too, it. I think if you would have went in another direction with the story instead of a rehash of the first one, it could have been funnier. So I want to see him do more and write stuff too, but as a lead actor, no thanks. Yeah, I think uh, he should let other directors direct him if he wants to be an actor. I mean, because it's like, I think he's coming from like doing cartoons and doing voiceover and he's really good at all that. He's also a great writer, you know, does a lot of uh, amazing writing with the cartoons that he does. Everyone loved Ted. He did the voice as, as the bear, you know, this one, uh, it's, it was no blazing saddles. It was horrible. Yeah. So I think if he wants to keep acting, maybe take a, a page out of the Tarantino book, have some other people have cast him as little side roles and like get some, uh, get some chops down by other directors. And here's the thing. I do think he's very charismatic <clears throat> as a personality. Yeah. But when you watch A Million Ways to Die in the West, one of the things you get, when you see Charlize Theron and you see... Um, uh, oh, who was the big bad guy in it? Uh, Liam, Liam Neeson. Neeson yeah. Lisa, they are acting in a movie. As a, that's a comedy, and they're acting in a movie. Whenever he's on screen, whenever Seth's on screen, he's acting like he's doing a skit show. Mm -hmm. He's acting like each scene is a, a new skit, mm -hmm. and he plays it like a skit. He plays it like something I'd see on Saturday Night Live, which was very jarring because then you got Charlize in there with him who's acting as if she's in a movie. And she studied and made a character. Yeah, who made a yeah. character. That's not something he can do. I think the movie I, the movie still wouldn't have worked, but I think it would have worked much better had it been somebody oh, yeah. other than him. Yeah. And you mentioned it might be good to, for if he wants to try acting, let other people direct him. I don't know that other directors want to work with him right. uh, you know, on that level. So anyway, I said we would save some time for Twitter questions at the end, and we're going to do that right now. Once again, follow us on Twitter, at Collider Video. Send in your questions right now, and we'll see if Ashley picks yours out. So Ashley, what do we got? Thomas Jelf the Third writes, "Love the show." Question: Who doesn't make it out of Captain America: Civil War? That is that is a million dollar question that's been going around, right along with who doesn't make it out of Star Wars right. Episode Seven. I mean, I have thought for a long time that Rhodey doesn't make it out, and I believe that we did not just see his death scene. And maybe we did, and they're using it as a total misdirect. <laughs> Let's put it in the trailer that way; they'll never think it's actually know, right? him that he really dies. He really is dead. Yeah. They're playing like. You know that I know that you know that I know. They're, they're playing that a little bit. Uh, I, I, I still think it's going to be Rhodey. I think because I can't think of anybody else other than Pepper, who's not a key character in the, in the franchise anyway. I can't think of any other of the Avenger ilk that you could kill off that would have a bigger emotional impact on Tony. That, that is Tony's closest friend. And if you really want to give Tony a huge emotional punch in the gut for dramatic purpose in the movie, there's nobody else that whose death would affect that more than Rhodey's because he's that important to Tony. So 
I'm gonna go with Tony. Uh, we'll do another. We'll do another board. Rody, Hawkeye, who's been on the board for a little while yeah. as well too, and then Cap at third. Do I think that's gonna happen? No, he's probably like a uh, hundred to one. But I. But I think that. I know that I think in in the comic book. I think he craps out in the comic book mm -hmm. and the vision that Tony had in Ultron kind of le was leading to something's going to happen to him, but I don't necessarily know if that's going to happen in Civil War. I would love to see Tony Stark get killed. Really? It's, it's possible. <clears throat> I, Not he, that I think I, he's got to be on the board. I, I, would I, love say... I love Robert Downey Jr. as an actor. I love Iron Man in all the films. I'm just saying that would be like a freak out launching into the rest of the you know Avengers universe that would really shake things up obviously Ant-Man's not gonna die um you know there's a whole bunch of people that you're sort of like they're not gonna kill this person not gonna kill that person they just announced Hulk and Thor Ragnarok so he's off the you know they, they're not gonna kill Thor he's got another movie Black Panther's got his own movie so sort of you can write some of those off automatically we don't know about Iron Man or Captain America they don't have a third a fourth film this is the third film for Iron Man. I mean, the, uh, Captain America and Iron Man's already had his third film. They have Avengers. Mm -hmm. I know they've announced. You know, they've announced all these actors are going to be in it. But who, who's to say what they're going to really do? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I would actually put on that board as far as the possible. I put Iron Man above Captain America. Yeah. I think there's a bigger That's chance Iron here. Man dies um, than him. So uh, let the speculation continue. All right, what's next? 73RRY, 7AY10R, right? <laughs> <laughs> what are the nice. odds that Bucky becomes Captain America in the new movie? Would like to hear everyone's opinions on this. Zero. Zero chance. Uh, Chris Evans has already said he's booked nine months solid shooting uh, uh, Infinity War back to back. And I don't think Marvel's going to pull another. He's dead. Okay, he's not really dead. Um, right, no. th th that on that fast of a turnaround. I mean, I could see them doing it if they weren't going to bring Chris Evans back for four years, then you could do that. You, you can't have, I mean, look, one of the things that Marvel has absolutely crapped the bed in, and I love all the Marvel films, is their propensity to kill, not kill everybody all the time in every single movie. Like everybody has died once or twice and come back almost immediately. Mm -hmm. I don't see them doing that. So because of that, um, I would say absolute zero. The only chance, the only chance I give Bucky becoming Captain America, which apparently the government wants to kill him, let alone give him the, sh the, the shield, but the only chance I give Bucky becoming Captain America is at the end of Civil War, uh, Steve Rogers, Chris Evans, is like, I'm done with this. And not dies, but walks away. And then maybe they turn to somebody else. But once again, the way this trailer sets it up, the government wants Bucky in prison and dead. Do they really want to give him the shield? I don't know, but it's the only chance I give Bucky coming Captain America. What do you think? Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think it's gonna. It won't happen in this film. And I don't think. I mean, the thing is, uh, Chris Evans could be like through Marvel, like fibbing and saying, "Yeah, I'll be in the Infinity Wars, you know, one and two. I'm doing this nine months, and none of that could even be happening. Maybe he is really taking a break for both of those movies, and. You know, Bucky is going to become Captain America. Who, who's to say? I don't think it's going to happen, though. Yeah, I think it's very slim unless they do kill off Cap and they and they want it because they've signed on Sebastian um, Stan for a, but a every, while. But every I know, actor I know signed, signed on for five, five, six, seven, I'm just saying that he's locked in. So yeah. they wanted to, they could, but I, I I don't think it's going to happen. I think for especially the fact that they want to close out Infinity War one and two with the main cast that we sure. really have known for so long, it makes sense. Now that's not to say that Cap won't die in in one of those movies, and you who knows? Know, not all. And yeah. who knows if maybe after that. Um, he takes the mantle and becomes Captain America. But as far as right after Civil War, we'll see what happens. All right, what's next? All right, changing gears a little bit. Michael93 writes, choose a horror movie franchise to remake for a new generation. Leprechaun? <laughs> uh, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> killer Leprechaun. Clowns from Outer Space. Uh, I would love to see a new version of that. Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Um... Let's see. I mean, oh. the one people keep talking about Jaws. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, that yeah. was that was a brain. There's a movie. It was called Brain Scan. I think it's brain. It was it was with Edward Furlong. And I know the, oh, with the creepy yeah, DVD yeah. clown creature yeah, but with that would hair. work so well with the virtual reality and stuff. That, that right. what was it called? Brain was that brain, brain scan or dream scan? What's, what's that called? Lawnmower Man yeah. would be another one that you could do. 
today. You could do Lawnmower Man. See, I, don't, I, I inherently hate Lawnmower Man because it's based on a short story by Stephen King that has nothing to do with the movie. Okay. Yeah, it's just like I would love to see them call it something different, but I guess since they kind of branded the movie with that idea of like I'm just a weird dude who gets sucked into yeah. a computer, you know. Uh, for me, I'd love to see them re re remake some of the old school horror films. You got, you know, Friday the 13th. I don't know why it's taking them That's 25 coming. years. It's coming. They keep saying that for like six years now. How hard is it to get some teenagers in Camp Crystal Lake and kill them? You know? <laughs> well, let's get on that, guys. Easier than you might think. I know, I know. You would think. Uh, what, Nightmare on Elm Street? I think yeah. that's a, they, they tried They've that. tried it. I think it's not 100% dead. Does Sex in the City count? Um, <laughs> no. It does. I would still, you know, they've tried the thing. Sex in the City at Crystal Lake? Yeah. Yeah. They've done a lot of them, but uh, I'd love to see another version of The Howling. You know, oh, how long uh, would be interesting? American Werewolf and uh, oh London. my god, I love that movie so much. Okay, what's next? Jibrin Khan writes thoughts on a breakup sequel. I really enjoyed the first one. No, no, uh, I didn't. Uh, and, and, and that's awesome that you did. I don't think there were enough of you though that that did, and I it didn't. I mean, it did all right though. Financially, it did okay. Yeah, I don't even know what you guys are talking about. It's uh, Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston, and it was it was it was a masterpiece. Yeah, it was <laughs> it. ten ten years ago too. Ashley's voting yeah. for the remake. They're both oh, yeah. close into their fifties now yeah. too. It's just let's I, get that one know. going, guys. All right. <laughs> all right, what's next? Austin Patrick writes: Would you like to see an Eight Mile Two? Uh, not me personally, but uh, if I'm a studio exec and somebody comes to me, uh, like a junior exec comes and pitches the idea, I would listen. I mean, I, as a fan personally, I'm not interested, but I think there might be enough people that are, and it would be something that you'd have to consider. There are a few stories that like, I also wanted to see a sequel to Private Parts with Howard Stern that, that mm. never happened. And with, and with 8 Mile, to see, I would like it to be a little bit more geared towards his real life too. I know a lot of it was, but there was there's a lot of the movie that made it into the first eight mile, the stuff that I didn't like. But I want to see, the Eminem has gone away from acting. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be the lead in Southpaw right. as well too. He just he doesn't want to do it. I think and he was, was supposed to be in Elysium. Yes, he just he just doesn't want to do it. Now that's not to say that he doesn't want to do it at all. Maybe there's something about his life going to that next phase where he hit success. I would actually be very interested in it to follow rabbit to see what happened going into and exactly. i wonder if curtis hansen would return to do it i would definitely be interested if they said they were doing i it. would uh, you know i wouldn't i wouldn't necessarily want to see something called eight mile two but right. i'd love to see like the next step in like a semi auto bio of him and dre you know like yeah. sort of how this was like an auto bio but not 100 percent eight mile for shared him. universe with yeah, like straight yeah. out of eight mile yeah something like that would be cool all right what's next Gabriel Bailey writes, can you think of any film centered around Thanksgiving other than Charlie Brown? Uh, you know, it's 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 weird because as a Canadian, Thanksgiving isn't that big of a holiday in Canada. We really, it's not, we don't celebrate. I mean, we all kind of uh, have our turkey dinner and we all do that, but it's not really considered a big holiday in Canada. Yeah. So I, I can't really think of any Christmas is the big deal to us so I can't really think I of got Eli Roth's it. Thanksgiving that he's never made like <laughs> turkey gravy all will be carved Thanksgiving <laughs> I just, I'm waiting for that movie Eli Roth get on that movie and make it uh, Family Stone is is that Christmas I can't I forget, remember I think but, it's Christmas uh, but there was one that Robert Downey Jr. did and I think it was with Holly Hunt um yeah, but I remember there's a movie that Robert Downey Jr. did. Wait, did wait what about? Didn't I think it's a different movie? Didn't Robert Downey Jr. and Zach Galifianakis's? That's uh, a different one. That's, but, that's but, road yeah, trip, no, it's yeah. a different movie. But didn't that revolve around them going back on Thanksgiving? No one remembers Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's I love that movie. Of them. I, I love that movie. And I don't remember why they were going. Yeah, I can't yeah. remember either. All right, what's next? James Fagan writes, "Hey crew, what are the odds of seeing a faithful movie adaptation of a Dr. Seuss story in the future?" Well, if you're doing it faithful, then it's going to be six minutes long. <laughs> green, uh, green eggs and ham, I am, I am. That's over, dude. Roll credits for two hours. I, I loved the Lorax, and I loved um, Horton Hears a Who. I thought Horton Hears a Who was, was I mean, yeah. They, I liked they, Horton Hears oh, a Who. Oh, I loved Horton Hears a Who. You know what I love that nobody else did? What? I like the live-action Grinch movie. <sighs> I know I like the one that you can care. I know a lot of people don't yeah. like it, but I got to tell you, I'll watch it, and I smile. They're I really doing they're, they're doing Cat in the Hat. Because Ken they already did one with Mike Myers. Well, the live action they're doing, but they're going to do it animated? in a style of uh, Horton Hears a Who. Oh, that, great. That, to me, I thought they, I think they work so well in that animation style. Mm -hmm. So getting away from live action, which... Yeah. You know what the director work. of Horton Hears a Who went on to do after that? What? Jonah Hex. 
Ouch. <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah. Mm. That train wreck. All right, what's next? Christopher Leiden writes, I hated Dracula Untold, but I like Luke Evans. In mm. it, do you, I like Luke Evans in it. Do you think that he's done in that universe because of how bad it was? Tough call because you're right. They, Luke Evans, I think, one of the underappreciated talents in Hollywood. I thought he was great in his Fast and the Furious turn. I think him and his brother will be back. I think him and Jason Statham will be back as a one-two double punch team of brotherly evil. Mm. I think that'll be great. Um, he has been underutilized. I think he was a inspired choice to do the Crow remake, but then that just dragged on for so long they lost him as well. Um, so if they wanted to do it, you could just say, hey, you know, that movie didn't work, but he's the guy. He's still the guy. Even though we didn't think the movie worked, he's the guy. And almost nobody saw it, so it's not like we're going to be confusing anybody. They could, but I don't think they will. Christian? I think he's done. I think he's going to go... No thanks. Yeah, <laughs> he's gonna go. Yeah, that necessarily that didn't work out too well. I mean, maybe they signed him to a contract to do a couple more, but I don't think anyone's gonna be pushing, especially now with the Mummy movies coming out. They're gonna focus more on that. Maybe maybe he pops in at a cameo or something too, but I think it's over. And let's not forget, he's got a huge movie coming out with Beauty and the Beast. He's playing Gaston, right? Right. So he's got that coming too. I would certainly hope that he puts that in the past. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> All right, what's next? Nart Sarsaroka writes, which one did you like more, D23 trailer or Jimmy Kimmel Civil War trailer? Jimmy Kimmel Civil War trailer. I mean, I loved the D23, but the D23 thing was not a trailer. It was like six minutes of random footage they slapped together, and they showed us some wonderful stuff. You keep hearing us talk about the Ant-Man bit in it, and which, when you see it, you'll know why we're talking about it, because it's really well done and fun and funny, but this was an artistically crafted trailer um, that every cut, every edit, every beat was purposeful, planned out. Um, so by far for me, the trailer as opposed to the footage of D23, what about you? The Kimmel stuff, yeah, yeah. Which for the element of the story and just the impact and everything we just talked about on the show today, was what, what it did as far as the excitement, as far as what we're gonna get and the Russo tone overall as opposed to, I love the D23 stuff, I raved about it, but this told me what the story is going to be about. Shep, which one did you prefer? Um, the only one that I saw. <laughs> but do we have to call it the Kimmel trailer? I'm like, yeah. look, isn't it just the regular? Kimmel would love it if I we know. did. I guess I'll, <laughs> hey, the Kimmel trailer is the winner to me. The Jimmy Kimmel Civil War trailer. <laughs> Jimmy Kimmel's the winner. Yeah, the Kimmel is the winner Kimmel on this one. Kimmel is the winner. Yeah, smart, smart move, Kimmel. All right, let's take two more. All right, the film circle writes, better director Edgar Wright or Christopher Nolan? Christopher Nolan. Edgar Wright, I mean, they, they're two very mm -hmm. different directors. And there will be a day that I'm just in the mood for an Edgar Wright kind of movie, and there'll be days you're in the mood for a Christopher Nolan kind of movie. I love them both. I think I even like Edgar Wright a lot more, but who is the better director right now? I think Edgar Wright would tell you it's, it's Christopher Nolan. Yeah, I think Nolan, I think he's got a little bit more experience as well too, and I think he just does a little bit more. I mean, Edgar Wright is phenomenal, and you know when you're watching him, it's his movie, he's got his, his, got his style, and he does one thing really, really well. It's not to say he's one trick, but like you just know what he's going to do, is where Nolan, kind of always surprises you with what he can do, how much he can do. And when you think that he's, oh, you've seen everything Nolan can do, he just does more. I wouldn't, I wouldn't put them in the same box. Yeah, so yeah I they're so different. I wouldn't, uh, neither one is better than the other one. They both do different kinds of films. And so I would not pick either. They're both great directors. See, you, you, you could make the argument, you say, hey, but could Edgar Wright have made Inception? And I would say, no, probably not. But then I would count that by saying, could Christopher Nolan had done uh, Scott... Pilgrim, uh, Pilgrim yeah. versus the world. No way he could have done that mm. the way Edgar Wright did it. So very, very yeah. different cats. I think it's uh, more of a question of who do you enjoy more? Yeah, yeah who yeah. sounds more your thing, yeah. yeah. All right, last question of the week. All right, Cleveland Spate writes, if Fox made a Doctor Doom movie, would all the rights for their Fantastic Four universe renew or just Doom? That's a great question. Um, well, they're not they're not part and parceled like that. It's, it's, it's one package thing. Uh, so I gotta think that if they did do it, I would think, I'm just speculating here, okay? I would think since it's all part of one package that if they did a Doctor Doom movie, the rights would stay with them, but uh, I don't think there's a lot of people out there outside of hardcore comic book fans that want a, a standalone Doctor Doom movie. Uh, it's, it's done. Fo Fantastic Four at Fox is done, should be done, and I never say that about properties that are with other studios outside of Marvel. I usually say keep them where they sure. are, but it, it's done. I mean, time for it to move along. Schnepp, what do you think? Yeah, I think it would be a stupid move. They're like, we're going to make the Silver Surfer movie. It's like, it's just not going to work. I don't think it'll work. You know, yeah. so it's sort of a, it's a, they've had their shot multiple times uh, and it's over. So, you know, 
you could have Edgar Wright write the script and Nolan direct it, and it's still going to be in trouble. Because, <laughs> because it's just, there's so much of a stink now. And right. it was, it's just everything about what just happened with Fantastic Four from publicly to what was on screen was just such a mess yeah. that anything that Fox does with it now, it doesn't matter how great it is, people are going to go, no. Either give it back to Marvel, we don't care. It's yeah, just what's going to happen. You're right. right they now. can make an incredible movie, like the one that just like sings, and everybody's like, "Oh, you got to go see it." It'll probably still be lukewarm received at the box office because of the triad of horrible. There's films a smell on it. Yeah. It's just hard. Yeah. Well, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. And once again, it's the final episode of the week. We're taking tomorrow and Friday off. Although we do have a new video going up tomorrow, which we cannot wait to share with you. But other than that, no movie talk. We're going to be celebrating the Thanksgiving Day holidays here. Um, uh, Ashley, I'm just curious, what are you going to be doing this uh, this Thanksgiving? Oh, I have two Thanksgivings to go to. So I'm just going to like stuff my face. I'm all about the yams. You guys, what, what are your favorite Thanksgiving items? The mashed potatoes and the turkey. Yeah. Yeah. And stuffing. Stuff. Classic. Yeah, 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 yeah. To me, yeah. stuff. I, I will actually, I'm, I'm notorious for, I will have, when we're passing around the place and doing the car, I will put more stuffing on my plate than turkey. Turkey is the side to my <laughs> stuffing. It really is. Covered in some nice yeah. gravy. Ah, uh, sounds so good. Yeah. And I'm vegetarian, so yes, oh, mashed right. potatoes, stuffing, let's go. That's and, uh, right. Yeah. And I'll, this, yeah. this weekend, I'll be working, strangely enough, finishing up a music video for a band called Pilgrim. That's awesome. So that's a appropriate. You're making that up. No, I'm dead serious. You're totally making that up. I'm dead serious. You're a liar. It's, it's a music video called The How Paladin. Fortuitous. The Paladin, and it's like all oh, green screen. It's taking me a long time. The catering to do. will be like. The catering will be minimal, and I'll be crying because I'll be spending the weekend finishing it. But yeah, we're going to go do uh, a little uh, feast, me and Holly. So, we'll, you know, it'll be good. Good. And see a bunch of movies. So. All right, guys. And we're rounding out to the end of the month, being November. And uh, No Shave November, thankfully mm -hmm. for me and my wife and everybody who has to look at me, is almost at an end. But once again, just a quick reminder, it is the purpose for cancer awareness. So if you have a couple extra bucks, do me a favor. Do everybody a favor. Find one of the organizations. There's many of them out there that support cancer research and donate some money to cancer research. I want to thank the guy sitting at the table with me, sitting over here, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? Let's see, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at John Schnepp, and please check out my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at www.tdoslwh.com. You could rent it. We've got a special Black Friday through Cyber Monday promotion for all you people hanging out and enjoying a festive uh, Thanksgiving uh, treat and freaking out. Uh, have some... Uh, have some uh, Superman Lives fun and rent my film. All right, sitting over here, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Well, Twitter and Instagram at Christian Harloff. But don't forget the Jedi Council. It's on today. We special might air it tomorrow. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, for, for no, that would be stupid. Let's air it today. It's going to air today. <laughs> uh, Jedi Council, we are taping it today. So make sure you watch it when it goes up today, as well as our Rebels recap. That will be up. And if you haven't already watched the Attack of the Clones commentary, you can watch me sweat and argue why I still don't think Yoda should have a lightsaber. And of course, our lovely host today, Miss Ashley Mova, whose hair is looking so good. Ashley, where can people find you online? On Twitter and on Instagram.